Bonsoir. Bonsoir. <laughs> Welcome. Bienvenue. Thank you for being with us tonight. Oh, I've been a Disney fan my whole life, so I'm so happy to be amongst you guys. It's more well, nervous up here, though. <laughs> Every story has a beginning, obviously. So tell us what's your beginning. How did you first, how did you start it working for, for Disney? Well, I grew up in New York, which is obviously on the east coast of the United States, and Disneyland is on the west coast in California. And uh, like most people of my era, Sunday nights was the wonderful world of Disney, wonderful world of color back then, where Walt Disney talked about Disneyland. And I wanted to go so badly. Uh, my father used to go to, Disney, uh, to California for work, and he would bring home, you know, the map of Disneyland or a vinyl record, if some of you know what that is, of attractions or postcards or animation cells, which they sold in the park. So of course I really wanted to go, but uh, you know, air travel in those times was very expensive when it came from a larger family. And so as much as I wished for it, I didn't think it was going to happen. But then one day, uh, watching the wonderful world of color, Walt Disney said, Disneyland is coming to New York, to the World's Fair. And thankfully, living in New York, uh, we went to the fair as a family. Uh, yes, that's me. Aww. Oh. What? I don't know why my mother let me go out dressed like that. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I, it was magical. And of course, the Disney shows at the New York World's Fair, which is where It's a Small World and the General Electric Carousel of Progress, uh, the Ford Magic Skyway and uh, the Mr. Lincoln for the Illinois Pavilion. They were so magical and they were so far beyond what any of the other pavilions were at the New York World's Fair. And so at that young age of eight, I said, I want to work for Disney. I want to be an Imagineer. Now, they unfortunately weren't hiring eight-year-olds, so I had to keep going to school. Um, and when I was in college, I said, well, I really want to do this. I really want to become an Imagineer. And so I thought the best way to do it would be to learn how attractions work. So I uh, went down to Walt Disney World and became a cast member, and I worked for two summers. Uh, the first summer I worked Skyway. I know I feel very old today looking at that. Uh, Skyway, and the second summer I worked Haunted Mansion, my favorite attraction of all. And, uh, at the end of that season, they mentioned that Epcot was going to be uh, built. And so I packed up my things and I drove to California. And thankfully I was hired uh, as a writer. And I started on several things on Epcot, but one of the early ones that I enjoyed was working on a pavilion called Horizons. Uh, this is George McGinnis, a terrific Imagineer who was the designer of the pavilion. And I was the writer of the, the script for the show. I also had a very bizarre uh, audio animatronics figure of me in the show, they were looking for a teenager, uh, and they looked at me and they said, they didn't have a teenage animatronic figure yet, and they said, well, Tom will be our teenager. So I ended up being inadvertently in the show playing a submarine mechanic. I'm not mechanical at all, so it was uh, not great casting. But anyway, I had a great time on Epcot, and after Epcot, I got the chance to work uh, with George Lucas on Star Tours, another of my favorites, um, a rare time when George didn't have a beard. Um, and that was a terrific experience as well. So I had a lot of fun experiences doing that and uh, that led to everything else. So when did you actually first visit Disneyland Paris here? So after Star Tours, I was asked to work on the Disney MGM Studios project in Florida. And as part of that, we made a lot of little short films to talk about movie making, how things were done. I think we must have done eight or nine of those. And at the end of that, I was ready to go back to working on attractions, but uh, Marty Sklar and Jeffrey Katzenberg said to me, no, we want you to start a film division at Imagineering. And I said, well, I don't know anything about that. So, well, you're gonna do it. So I said, okay. So we started a group called Theme Park Productions, which I led for, I think, 20 years. And one of the first projects that we did was for Disneyland Paris, was a little Circle Vision show called The Visionarium. Oh, you know it? Okay, you are fans. Uh, and we had a lot of fun trying to, try and experiment to tell a story in Circle Vision, which is a complicated format to shoot in. Um, but we had a lot of fun and we had some great uh, actors, uh, Gerard Depardieu, 
you know, shot a scene with us at, at uh, the airport and after the shoot, he opened up, brought out wine and we drank wine. Said, wow, I love this. Um, but that was great and we did, a lot of, we did a lot of motion pictures in that era. And um, that sort of led to what I do now. So if you say, well, what do I do? Yeah, well, that was my next question, actually. What do I do? <laughs> it's kind of a strange, a portfolio executive. What does that mean? Well, I do, I do several things. Um, one of the things I do is master planning. So part of what I do is thinking about the future of the parks, what attractions are coming, how are we going to grow them, how are we going to design them for the next generation so they can keep evolving. Um, part of what I do is working with this very talented team of Imagineers here in Paris uh, who work on, on the designing and expanding and growing the park on a day-to-day -day basis. And we have teleconferences every week, so I meet with them every week and they show me everything from hotel designs to new carpets to landscape designs, paving designs, attraction ideas. Um, they're so talented. Uh, Tracy Eck is the art director for the Disneyland Park and Natalie piet is the art director for Walt Disney Studios and the Village. And uh, Sylvie Massara is an incredible designer for the hotels. So I have the joy of getting to work with this talented team uh, every week. And then in addition to that, I work with our Imagineering team over here that's working on some of the projects you probably saw uh, as part of the 25th. So part of going into the classic attractions and bringing them back to Disney standards and adding some Disney magic to them, which I have to say was the most fun for me. Um, you know, getting to go into Pirates and Small World and, and Star Tours and all those attractions. Um, so I have a, a variety of things that I do and occasionally I get to write still. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. You said it already, but I'm going to ask you again. What's your favorite attraction then here at Disneyland Paris? Well, at Disneyland Paris, um, it's a tough question. I like to say it's whatever I'm working on currently because we do love so much what we're doing. Um, you know, having worked a little bit on all the parks and been around to all the parks, I, I would have to say Big Thunder Mountain Railroad is the most spectacular. It is, it is insanely beautiful and being out there on the water, it's, I love it. It's great, but I have some others too, I think. So I do love Star Tours because I spent more than 30 years of my life working on it, starting on the original one in California, uh, and recently doing the Adventures Continue, which is the, the update of it, and the new designs that we got to do for, obviously for your beautiful park, Nick Kamori, uh, the designer of this, really a lot of fun. Um, and I love that we were able to make it branching now so that we can keep it updated and part of the fun I get is, is to actually continue to add new sequences to the show you know every time we get another trilogy film so I'm anxious to get going on the next one um, but I love that because it keeps the attraction relevant keeps it fresh for you because I know we always love going to the parks the things we know and love but also what's new what's coming next so I think Star Tours is obviously near and dear to my heart. In this park, I have to say Cinemagique uh, was a really fun project for us to do, and uh, I, I loved that show. And uh, every time I would see it, I, I would start to cry and laugh. Um, had a wonderful story, had a, and it was a wonderful celebration of the films. I'm very excited about what's coming next to that theater, um, which is part of keeping the parks alive and growing. Can I share a little secret about Cinema Yes. Please. I started here 16 years ago and uh, I did the very first show of the oh. opening. That was me! Woo! Should we do it tonight? <laughs> I'm so proud. I think it was a wonderful. I think for Theme Park Productions, our film unit, I think that was probably one of the best shows that we ever did. More recently, I have to say, a project that I got to write and direct that I truly love in, in this park is this show, Ratatouille. Um, and fun to, bring, fun to bring an immersive land into the park. Uh, fun to do an attraction where, where the story ends in a meal, because it is Remy, um, that you actually get to have a storyline that's all about Remy creating a meal for you, and then at the end you actually get to go into the restaurant and have the meal. So, and I'm very excited that we are bringing this uh, attraction to Epcot in Florida, which is my other job. So, what do you think makes Disneyland Paris so special? Well, I think at the root of it, the fact that, you know, the stories that Walt Disney brought to life early in his career had their roots in Europe and in France, the fairy tales, the fables. Um, and so there is, a, there is a DNA, I think, to Disney parks that really starts here. Beyond that, though, I think 
It has a lot to do with the Imagineers who work on the park. And I know Catherine said this, but I will say it too. This is the most beautiful Disney park in the world. You have the most beautiful Disney park. No question. Sorry, Shanghai. Um, I know I'll get in trouble for that. No, it is, it is the most beautiful park, and it, and it has a lot to do, as I said, with the Imagineers, because if you think about it, Disneyland in California and the Magic Kingdom in Florida, those were parks that were designed primarily by the original Imagineers, the original Imagineers that Walt brought from the studio and hired to create this new medium of the theme park. But by the time we get to Paris, you now have a next generation of Imagineers. You know, people who grew up with Disneyland as a kid who finally get to be at the point in their careers where they can design the ultimate Magic Kingdom Park. And so this castle, you know, the most beautiful, of course, and designed by Tom Morris, extraordinarily talented Imagineer, incredible designer, incredible sense of color. You know, his fantasy land is just uh, extraordinary, I think. And there is no main street in the world that is more detailed and more incredible than your main street designed by the very talented Eddie Sato. It, it's just extraordinary. And the biggest adventure land in the world, I think, and really due to Chris Teets, very talented designer, and his Pirates of the Caribbean is, you know, the grandest of them all until Shanghai sort of reinvented it, but uh, in a different way. And then, of course, I said this, you know, Big Thunder and Frontierland, Jeff Burke, you know, it is CinemaScope. It is, you go into Frontierland, it just goes on and on and on and on. And it's so, so beautiful. And Discoveryland, you know, the Tomorrowlands in our park are the most difficult lands to design because you can't go to a book and say, you know, what did the architecture look like in this year and what was the color palette? You have to imagine it uh, wholly. And I think what's so beautiful about what was done by Tim Delaney is he paid homage to Jules Verne and Melier and, and how much of the future and our dreaming of the future, you know, came from France. So I think it really has a lot to do with these guys and especially with this guy, Tony Baxter, a true, a, a true legend. And, and uh, I had the pleasure of working with him on Star Tours many years ago, but he truly is brilliant. And he put his heart and soul into it as, as all those Imagineers did. And I think that's really what I think that's really what makes this park, the First Gate Park, so unique. <laughs> Tom, how do you find your inspiration? Do you just wake up in the morning and... I do wake up in the morning. I mean, yes. <laughs> obviously, but... <laughs> I do. Um, well, you know, you find inspiration in many ways. Um, I think we have the best jobs in the world. It's most fun. Every day is different. There's nothing, no two days are the same. Um, my day starts pretty early, usually around 5.30. And uh, when I wake up and I'm starting to check my emails from Paris, because obviously you're, you're all awake and the office is awake. Um, and then when I get to the office, uh, we have video teleconferences and we're looking at projects. And then somewhere afternoon, I switch over to my other job, which is Epcot, because we're reinventing Epcot right now. And that's where I started my career, so I'm doing that. But really, you know, finding inspiration for Imagineers is looking at the world around you. We try and see as many movies, as many theatrical shows. We try and go to museums, we go to exhibits. Um, getting out in the world, you just discover things that inspire you for things that you're working on. Travel is the greatest research tool in the world. Uh, love to travel, and all Imagineers love to travel. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to remain a kid as best you can. How do Imagineers get to work on projects glo globally? Well, you're pretty much assigned. It's not like you go in and say, I'd like to work on this. Most of the time, it's like, you're going to work on this. Um, and you get very lucky, I think, because you know who wouldn't want to work around the world? Um, I happen to love France and Paris, so I think I have the best, I think I won the best lottery with this project. But a, a lot of times, it depends on the projects that you have done before, you know, if, if you've created um, if you've created a, a frozen attraction for Epcot, you might be working on a frozen attraction somewhere else. If you're working on Marvel somewhere, you'll be working on Marvel somewhere else. So a lot of it has to do with the projects that come up and what we need from talent, who's the right talent to assign. And I can tell you, we have more work now than ever. I've never seen it so crazily busy at Imagineering, um, and I think that's really exciting. How do you think technology play a, a role in storytelling? 
Well, obviously it all started with Walt and a mouse. Um, and Walt was fascinated with how technology could help bring his stories to life. And you know, you know it better than anyone else. All of the technological achievements that he had with synchronized sound and color and the multi-plane camera and, and Fantasound. And uh, you know, he, he just thought that technology could aid in the story to make things more believable, more real, more dimensional. And uh, I, I think when it came to the parks, well, suddenly he had to invent everything. I mean, I remember the story he told about his disappointment with Fantasia, that he had an idea to make it widescreen and have you know, stereophonic sound in the theater long before Hollywood ever did that. But the theater owners didn't want to do it for one film. Well, once he built Disneyland, he's building a theater for a specific film. And so that's, I think, where Circle Vision came from and some of the other formats. He did 3D in the parks. Um, we use technology today still as an aid in storytelling. How do we make things more believable for you? If I want you to feel like you're in the trenches of the Death Star, like Luke Skywalker, I'm gonna need a motion simulator to make you feel that. It's not enough just to be in a static seat and watching something on a screen. Um, so we continue to look for that and we continue to look for it with, we have a research and development team at Imagineering. And so they're pushing the boundaries. Some of you have seen what was done with Avatar uh, it, at Walt Disney World with incredible animatronic figures, you know, pushing interactive characters, pushing that. And these are all tools, but um, they're tools in support of storytelling. So we don't usually talk about them. We don't usually put them on display. When we did Star Tours, you know, one of the visitors said, well, you should show people how that works. That's incredible, that device. And we said, no, not at all. We don't ever want to show you the device. We want you to believe that you're really flying. We don't want to take the magic away. Um, we're magicians, happily enough, on this stage. So what would be a typical day at work for an Imagineer? How do you start your, is it like Catherine? You have a big it's like cup Catherine. of coffee we, in the morning? <laughs> well, we have a Starbucks right at Imagineering, so it makes it very easy um, to get a venti start to the day. And as I said, we have teams all around the world. So some have, have days that start very early because they're talking to places like this. Some have days that are later because they're talking to Asia um, and doing projects. But like Catherine, um, we do a lot of VTCs connecting all of our different sites. We have Imagineering teams everywhere around the world um, that are doing more and more locally um, because we have so much more work. Um, we do come and, you know, there's nothing like being there physically, like here. I come to Paris about every six weeks for about a week. Um, I'd love to spend more time here. I love it. Um, but I go to Florida as well for Epcot. So we travel a lot. We use technology a lot to connect each other. And like I said, we have very, very talented teams in each of our sites to carry on the work. Are there many different jobs at uh, Imagineering? There are, I know the video said 100, I think there are even more than that. Yes, there are, you know, doing things in a dimensional format requires a lot of people. I, you know, if I'm like you, I, I, you know, just went to go see the Avengers film recently, and when the film is over, you know how you see that crawl and you just see all those names. You can't believe how many people it takes to make that two hour movie. Well, it takes that many people to make a, a park attraction because you're building something physical. You're not just making the movie, you're making essentially the theater. And so we have, of course we have artists and writers and designers and sculptors and landscape architects, but we have engineers and we have project managers and we have people that are skilled in every aspect of making something real. Um, we also have very great partners at Pixar and Lucasfilm and Marvel that work with us to make sure that we bring their stories to life in the most amazing ways. Uh, so many, many careers, and people often ask, how do I become, what do I do to become an Imagineer? Um, I think a lot of it is find the field that, that is your passion. Imagineers are passionate about their work. We don't, we don't think of work just as work, it's work as play, work is fantastic, it's inspirational. So find, the, find what you're best at, and go get even better at it, and then also, Learn what you can about storytelling. You know, go to theater, go to films, you know, take courses if you wish to learn about how storytelling takes place. You know, our storytelling in the park is very different than storytelling for television or motion pictures. We usually only have a few minutes to tell a story, so we tell it in a different way. Um, 
but it's an extraordinary it's an extraordinary company and I'm always humbled because I, I'm surrounded by people that are far smarter than me and when you see the things that, that come out of Imagineering, when you see Pandora or you see Cars Land or you see the castle here, you know, the, they're just amazing achievements, I think. What do you think would be the main qualities of an Imagineer? Let's say if I have to apply? Well, I just gave it to you, so I'll tell you more. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of you, your question. <laughs> I, I can, it's this magician stage. I can tell what question you're going to ask before you ask it. Um, like I said, Imagineers are curious, they're passionate, they love what they do. You know, whatever you do in life, you should do what you love. Find the thing that you love, whether it's Imagineering or something else. Find what you love and do what you love. Because if you do what you love, you're going to be happy. You know, you spend a lot of your time at work and uh, you've got to love it. I mean, I'm, I get so excited every morning going into work because I really never know what's going to happen. Um, I don't look at my calendar in advance. Maybe then I wouldn't be so <laughs> anxious to get in there. So we have a lot of meetings, like Catherine said. Um, but uh, really, go, go for your passion. You can't go wrong if you go with what you love. Mentors there at Imagineering. I did, and I want to show you. I've, I've had many mentors, because um, I need to learn a lot. But these are two of mine. This is the guy who hired me, Marty Sklar. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Marty Sklar worked with Walt. He wrote a lot of Walt's speeches, the famous uh, Florida film that announced Epcot was written by Marty. Um, he hired me right out of school. I brought in a, uh, I thought because of Imagineer, I didn't know there were writers. You know, at the time it's like, when you go to the parks, you don't realize the skills that it takes to bring the parks to life or what jobs are there. So I thought, because what I'd seen in the parks were all models and things. So I built a model of a Winnie the Pooh ride and uh, it was pretty horrible, I have to say. Not the right idea, but the model, because I'm not a model builder. But I thought that's what you had to have. And it was probably twice the size of this table, and I drove it in my car across the country, and I kind of had it under my arm, and I went in, I had my interview with Marty, um, and he said, so what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to come up with ideas for rides. And he said, well, kid, we don't, don't hire people off the street for that. <laughs> what? Um, what else can you do? He said, can you write? I said, yes, I can write. And so uh, he hired me as a writer on one condition, and that is that I'd never build another model in my career. <laughs> and I never have. Um, I learned, I worked with Marty for decades and learned so much from him. He was, he was very generous with his knowledge. And because he had worked with Walt, he really taught us all about, you know, that the attention is in the details, as well as the long shot, as he would say, the master shot, to, to pay attention to all the details, and that every element of what you do is important, so don't overlook it. And the other guy that was a mentor is this guy, Exitensio. <laughs> Sweetest man in the world, had the office next to mine, and X was a writer. He, he came over to Imagineering, he wasn't a writer when he came to Imagineering, but Walt said, X, go over to Imagineering, and, and one day said, I want you to write a script for Pirates of the Caribbean. And he said, Walt, I've never done that. He said, well, you'll do it. So he put on a pirate hat. And of course, he wrote Yo-Ho, Yo-Ho, and, and the song and the dialogue for Haunted Mansion and, and many other things. But a very, a very generous man who taught me about writing for theme parks, which is different than writing for films or television. So I miss them both. They recently passed away. Um, but they passed a lot of that knowledge on, not only to me, but a lot of my colleagues. Everyone is so excited about the big enhancement of the Walt Disney Studios here in Disneyland Paris. Um, can you share some secrets? Can you tell us more? Tom? Well, I would, but Catherine already <laughs> did. So you know this is, the, this is Walt Disney Studios today, um, and this is tomorrow, which we're very, very excited about. <laughs> so, we're really in early stages of this, and uh, you know, it is all, always inspirational to have an artist give you a vision of where you want to go. And, but I'll, I'll share some of the things that Catherine did, maybe tell you a little bit more. But you know, one of the challenges for this park is that it, it, it has a circulation path that I call the boomerang, which is off to animation and off to rock and roller coaster on this side. And it's lacking some of the DNA of a classic Disney park. It's lacking a main street, and it's lacking a hub. And so the notion in this one is that we're doing a different kind of main street, which is more like the Tuileries in Paris. We're, doing, we're going to do a beautiful garden walkway that will take you down to 
the lake, which we're super excited about, and around the lake will be a number of immersive worlds that you will step into. And I'm sure by now you've decoded what some of those might be um, for now, but obviously uh, frozen. You know, what, what, what we really want to bring to this park are more immersive lands and immersive worlds. Um, that frankly it's been lacking and that it needs to have and I think you know Ratatouille's given us a taste of that's what we want We want to we want to step into a world and be completely surrounded by that and we want more of that And we want it in a bigger scale um, And we also know I say we because I'm a fan like you um, You also know some of the things that we're doing around the world that that we want to bring here things that we know you want to see And so we know you want to see frozen um, And so frozen if you look at this frozen is really our castle you know, that's the weenie that's going to draw you down as you're moving down toward the lake. Um, Elsa's Ice Palace is going to be, you know, if you're from California, I might say Matterhorn-esque. It's going to be drawing you down to the lake. Um, and then all along, you're going to have beautiful gardens. The lake, as you can imagine, will be a fantastic place for entertainment spectacles, day and night. Um, fantastic viewing, fantastic uh, for our entertainment team here to give them a beautiful lake to work on. And then I think if you go off to the left, you might recognize um, that Star Wars is, is coming to Paris as well. And then off behind me on the left, uh, you're already aware of the fact that, that Marvel is coming to part of the park that's already here. So it's going to be a combination of, of bringing placemaking to some of the existing facilities for Marvel and then uh, creating, creating the room for this park to grow. This, we have a lot of room for this park, and uh, it's exciting to take this first um, phase of the park to open it up and to bring you, obviously, these stories and attractions that we know you're excited to see. Apart from that, anything new you're currently working on here at Disneyland yes, Paris? Yes, I just have too much fun. <laughs> um, so, there Marty and I are in California, looking very dour. Um, at the Haunted Mansion. I told you this is my favorite. I had a lot of fun, you know, when I worked as a, a ride operator in, in Florida. There were parts of the show that I thought we could add some magic to, and I, I, I was very lucky to be a part of doing that reimagining of Haunted Mansion. And out here, you know, we, we went through, as I said earlier, the classic e-ticket attractions, what I call the e-ticket attractions, in the Disneyland Park to bring them up to today's standards. And uh, Phantom Manor, was last on the list because we couldn't close everything. We had, you know, as you know, being fans, we had to, taking an attraction down is, is hard on, on guest visiting, but you have to do it if you want to bring it to the next level because we wanted to do really big work in each one of those. And Phantom, you know, got pushed out and uh, when Catherine came on board, I said, you know, there is one more we want to do in the, in the first park. And she said, what's that? I said, well, that's Phantom Manor. Um, so I said, all right, so let's do it. So you know it's, it's, it's down now, and uh, you've seen probably this footage that appeared recently on the blogs. Um, it is an incredibly thorough um, job that the team is doing on Phantom Manor. We're touching everything, even these wires, um, <laughs> and going in. And it's, and it's an unusual uh, job, of course, because we've got to make everything new, and then we have to make it not look new um, and make it feel like it's always been there. But it's, the team is having an incredible, incredible time uh, in there now. In fact, tomorrow, Monday, sorry, Monday I get to go in and uh, see the work that's being done, which is very exciting. So I'm happy that this one is, is coming back, and I hope you're excited to see it come back as well. Everything, outside, inside, it's, it's amazing. It's, you know, it's uh, in California where I live, people talk about the Golden Gate Bridge and then when you paint the Golden Gate Bridge, by the time you get to the other side, you have to go back and start all over again. And it, it's, it's kind of that way in, in our parks, you know, that by the time you've finished working on this hotel and do the other hotels, you've got to go back to this one and the attraction's the same way. You have to, you really have to keep it up with maintenance. Um, but there is some legacy to this attraction that uh, we're going to bring back. And I think you guys probably know what it is, or you're about to. When hinges creak in doorless chambers, where candlelights flicker though the air is deathly still, this is Phantom Manor. And that is Vincent Price. <laughs> Who 
who you probably know from Thriller, but probably, but uh, obviously a very famous horror film actor um, who did some early recording for Phantom Manor. And one day I got a call from Catherine Powell, who said, Tom, is there any way we could bring the Phantom Manor Vincent Price tracks back? And I thought, how did she know about this? How did she know about that? She's amazing. Uh, and so uh, we went back in the morgue and we found the tracks. And uh, when we bring Phantom Matter back, you will see how we've found a way to bring some of that original into the show. Uh, we're, also, we're also bringing some of the magic up to this century with some new magic that you'll discover in the attraction you know and love. And uh, I think we will, from a storytelling standpoint, we will reveal at long last exactly who the Phantom is. So, stay Woo! tuned. We will stay tuned, definitely. Tom, thank you so much for sharing those secrets with, with us, with me, with all of us. I hope you're enjoying your first ever Fun, day, fun Days event. And remember one thing, it is so much fun, fun to, to be, be a, a fan. fan. Thank you Have guys so much. Have a